But I looked at my sergeant major and I said, this is a one-way mission. If it goes wrong, it's going to go really badly wrong. And that's it. I said, I'm still getting on that helicopter, but this is not right. Your body in that state, it basically starts pooling all of the warm blood in your core. And that's why you lose the, the use of your fingers, your arms, your legs. By moving quickly and trying to warm up, all of that warm blood starts going to your fingers, hands, and then that's making you even more cold. We were breaking every SOP in our book. Welcome to the Danger Close podcast presented by Six Hour. My guest today is Chris Ryan. Chris is the author of One That Got Away. It's an incredible story of human resiliency, of survival, um, and the power of the human spirit. Without further ado, Chris Ryan. It basically came that there'd been a, a deal brokered that they would send three patrols deep into, into Iraq in the Ambar region, and uh, they would um, establish observation posts and um, we were to locate uh, Scud missiles. When we were tasked for this, I can remember going to the, um, the sergeant major and saying, okay, uh, we, night, we need night vision. And there was, there's none, there's none left for you. Um, we need suppressed weapons. This guy came and said, Jody, who the hell do you think you are, James Bond? And I'm like, <laughs> no. And that, mind you, that was the thinking at the time. Yeah. It was suppressed weapons, who uses them type oh, of my. thing. Um, the mapping we were supplied um, dated back to 1945. So we went in basically half cocked and we were going in as an eight man patrol. So we decided not to take the vehicle. We'd fly in and then we'd walk to our observation point. Yeah. Each man had um, basically around about 120 pounds to 150 pounds, depending on what the what radio system they had in. Um, we obviously had our belt kit, which was around about 40 pounds. I had a, a two or three some of the lads had uh, 16s and um, a couple of them had the minimis. Um, we then had um, a jerry can each uh, of water and um, a, a couple of sandbags with extra rations and the NBC suits because there were still rumours that they had these weapons of mass destruction or they were going to gas us, which it was, it was crazy. But it was more the information that we were going in. We broke every single rule that the, the regiment wrote out on SOPs, the standard operating procedures. And we um, there was three patrols. We used two Chinooks to go in. We inserted, when we got off the, uh, the bird and it, it lifted off, um, we realized how cold it was. Um, and Iraq actually was having the worst winter in 30 years. Um, the equipment, as you know, you can't carry 170 plus pounds in soldier. So we were basically sherpering this kit, like, as in taking it up, dropping it off, walking back, getting it, and then sh ferrying um, different bodies backwards and forwards. And then we got to the um, our selected um, OP point, which um, we'd read off, off a map. And uh, what we found, we were expecting sandy conditions and it was flatbed rock. So it meant we couldn't go underground. Um, we would we came across this um, dried wadi bed and the road that we were supposed to be looking at, um, it was just a series of tracks. So really we knew a scud wasn't going to come down um, that road. First light, we started looking around. There was a ridge line running uh, east to west. But on top of the ridge line, um, there was an anti-aircraft position, quite clearly. And uh, we, we basically tried to establish comms. We couldn't get through. Uh, we couldn't establish anything. And we had 17 radios between the eight of us, different types. And uh, one of the signalers, before we deployed, he'd worked out the frequency codes, but he'd worked them out on the Latin long for um, Kuwait. We were asking to be relocated. And... Um, Nothing came through. And then in the afternoon, um, a young goat herder came in and he was probably about two or three hundred feet away from our position. Um, he got into a truck and disappeared. So that night we sent out recce's and um, all we found was uh, anti-aircraft positions everywhere. We were stuck right in the middle. We didn't know what it was, whether it was troops in reserve or a, a military facility, but we were smack bang in, in these... Um, between these anti-aircraft positions. That night, uh, we did the recce, came back, and it was it was freezing cold. I mean, the temperatures were below zero um, during the day and at night. 
That next day, we spent all the time trying to establish comms. And then the um, goat herder came back at about the same time. But this time, he came right up onto the, the overhang. And he was looking down and he, he saw one of the guys and uh, ran off. So we knew we'd be compromised. So at this point, I basically um, rigged up a system uh, for the Morse code. And uh, within the British Army, I, I don't know if it's the same for yourselves, you have a guard net, which is like an open net. Mm. And um, it's just monitored by a signaler. And I knew Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, we had a base there. They would have a guard net. So I just started tapping away on Morse code. And, you know, like, thank the Lord, um, a guy just came back and he said, yeah, you've got signal strength fives and started tapping back to him. Um, we had a code word, which was turbo. And um, I basically said compromise. He got back to me saying, you know, message um, clear, uncorrupted. And uh, we thought, right, that's it. There'll be a chopper coming in to pick us up because um, we had a lost comms procedure for 48 hours and that was still within that window. So we packed all the gear up. We started ditching all the, the rubbish, like the thermal sheeting, like extra rations, things like that, to, to get lighten this load down. And um, as we were just about to move, we heard the dreaded sound of a tracked um, vehicle. So we we cocked our 66s. We, you know, we were sitting waiting. What it was, it was um, like a bulldozer, uh, what we would call a bulldozer with a big um, blade yep. on the front. Sure. He had it halfway up and he was in like a military jacket and he was just peering over the top. Then he saw us and he just started reversing back. We then said, right, let's start making to the um, the pickup point and we should get there at uh, 20 hundred. So as I was leading the patrol out, uh, there was two Iraqis and um, they had military uh, uniforms on and um, they had AK-47s over there, over the shoulder. So I told the guys, I said, just keep moving. And, um, you know, we've got company now. And they started to parallel us um, as we were walking out. And then I, I made that dreaded mistake um, of, um, I thought, right, okay, they can't see our faces. I'm going to bluff something here. So I lifted my left hand, which is an insult unbeknown to me at the mm -hmm. time, and, and waved to them. As soon as I did that, it kicked off. Um, they started, um, they opened up on us. Uh, rounds started firing. We returned fire. We dropped them too. Um, but at the same time, the vehicles uh, turned up and guys started de uh, debussing from the vehicles. And then we came under a good um, a, a good uh, rain of uh, fire. And it got to the point where we realized we couldn't carry our rucksacks. So we ditched the rucksacks. And as we were like going up, up the hill, the anti-aircraft guns had opened up on us. They had leveled, wow. they'd come down at a level and they were like, I mean, they were they were flying. And as I crossed the um the the, the brow of the hill, I was just totally amazed that all the guys were there and nobody being hit the Iraqis started moving towards our position in their vehicles, but the guys on foot were staying behind the vehicles and they were slowing down. So we decided that we would put a dog's leg in, as in head south to make it look like we're heading to Saudi Arabia. Then we would head uh, west and then turn north and head, to, head up to Syria. Mm -hmm. um, it was the shortest option. And as the, say, crow flies, it was going to be about, 75 miles um, we started uh, walking at a reasonable pace and then um, darkness came in and just before we started heading north we knew we would actually come to the the base of that ridge line that had the anti-aircraft positions on there at some point so i said to the patrol commander listen i'm going to walk on my night sight i just stuck it on my eye and i kept just walking and I, i'd said I'm going to walk as fast as I can, just tell the guys, head down and arse up and, and walk. It was probably an hour and a half of like good, strong tabbing. And I turned around and I had um, one guy who'd actually collapsed uh, behind me and another guy and um, the other five guys were missing. And I, I just made the decision now, right, there's, it's the three of us and uh, we've got uh, two weapons, so we carry on. So that night... We um we covered it was around about seventy kilometers, around about fifty miles. Mm. Um, I mean, our weight was still around about forty five pound, you know, plus the the weapons, and the ground was very um 
um, like it was just l- small rocks, but it was hard walking. Uh-huh. And uh, we all blistered our feet, uh, which was going to prove a big problem for me later on. Yeah. Um, so it was about 5 a.m., 5, 6 a.m., um, the, cl- the the sky it was um, it was still pitch black, but you could see there was a lot of uh, cloud in there, and um, I was starting to get worried because it was again it was really flat and uh, there was no cover, and um, I came across a, a tank berm. And for the audience that aren't military, a tank berm is a construction of of basically earth um, mounded up on three sides. A tank can come in there and it has cover, but it can fire out at that side. So I got the, the guys in and we lay head to toe in there. And then it, just as first light was coming up, started to look around and um, I could see a small box bodied vehicle with a large mast. Now I didn't know if it was a building or a, or a vehicle. And I could see the Iraqi soldiers moving around it within half an hour. Um, started snowing. Oh, wow. <laughs> because of my experience, when it started snowing, there was a high wind chill factor. The wind was blowing. But more more importantly, the snow kept changing into rain. And the ditch that we were in kept filling up with water. And it, it probably saved us in terms of these Iraqi soldiers who were close by didn't you know, uh-huh. walk over to us. But Vince started showing all the classic signs of um, hypothermia. And um, he was he was going down rapidly. Um, I can honestly say it was the longest day in my life, and I've worked in some of the coldest environments in the world. I wouldn't let anybody move. Um, our SOPs is during the day you don't move, so I said nobody's moving, and I made them stay still. Now I know I've got to live with a, a man's life here. Um, it um, it's it uh, it eighteen hundred. Um, it was dark and I said, right, let's move. Well, when we came to move, um, it was nearly impossible. We'd lost the use of our fingers, our our toes. Um, It felt like you were just crippled with arthritis in your knees, your thighs, your your lower back. And um, trying to stand up was an effort. We tried to move around in the confines of the tank berm to get some movement. But all we were doing um, was actually um, making ourselves um, colder because your body in that state, it basically starts pooling all of the warm blood in your core. And that's why you lose the, the use of your fingers, your arms, your legs, because the blood is being sucked up into your core to keep your vital organs going. But by moving quickly and trying to you know, warm up, um, all of that warm blood starts going to your fingers, hands, and then that's making making you even more cold. My main concern now was um, if we bump into the Iraqis, um, I will not be able to operate my weapon. Can't feel my hands. Um, by this time, the snow and rain had stopped, but there was cloud, uh, high winds, and the moon would come out now and then, and all of a sudden everything would light, light up. It would darken down. And um, uh, at this point, Vince started... Um, like screaming, uh, making a lot of noise. Um, He was showing all the classic signs of of hypothermia. So I would walk back, um, talk to him. And this is, I mean, without going into detail for the respect of his family, but I would try and G him on in terms of remind him of his family. Um, I would shout at him. I would do lots of different things to see if I could get like some type of reaction. So at this point, um, I said to Stan, who was with me, um, you you and him stay about um, probably about 50 to 100 feet away from me. Just keep me in sight. Don't lose sight of me, but let me get up ahead and I can walk. And if he's making noise, hopefully I'll see the enemy beforehand and then I'll move back and then we'll box around them. So we did that. And um, I'm not really sure how long we'd been walking. Um, and um, uh, Stan said, um, I've lost contact with Vince. He died that night. You know, just before first light, we um, we lay there cuddling one another in. The sun came up, but it was still like, you know, blue skies, but not enough to think I'm comfortable here, but enough to get your fingers moving. So we lay there and uh, sure enough, and again, I'm sure you know, you sat in the middle of nowhere and then, the, the goat herder comes out of nowhere. In Afghanistan he, still, we learned he, it again. Yeah, exactly. And you know 
you, you, you've got hundreds of waddies around you and um, the freaking goats just come and they stopped off at the wadi we were in. And as we were lay there, they, they started to walk up towards us and we just kept down. They walked past just grazing. And the, the, the goat herder, he was a big unit, big lad, uh, probably about <coughs> 20 odd, 25. And um, I started looking and I went, right, if he comes up here, I'm going to drop him. And um, Stan being a gentleman, I would say, he said, no, 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 he can't do that. I went, yeah, I am. If he's coming up, if we tie him up, he'll die anyway. If we if we do him, we've done him, and that's it. If we let him go, he's going to tell the Iraqi forces, and they're going to be onto us. So sure enough, um, he stood up and started walking towards us. And when he stood up, I realized he was a big guy. I'm only 5'10", but uh, Stan's about 6'4". So I said, you grab him, I'll stick him, and uh, we'll drop him, bring him down. And uh, Stan... <laughs> Stan, uh, he said, uh, no, no, he said, that's against the, the uh, rules of uh, engagement and all the rest of them. I'm like, screw the rules of engagement, mate, <laughs> you know. Um, so as it was, he jumped up, grabbed him, but protected him and sat him down. And it was the right thing to do, to, to be honest, really. And then Stan said, uh, I trust this guy. And I went, you've got to be kidding me. I said, um, we'll keep him here and then we'll leave it, uh, it last night. He went, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and see if I can get this vehicle. And I was like, no. And he went, yeah. So he, he took his belt kit off and he, he left his rifle and started walking off. And I'm looking at them and I thought, this is wrong. So I called him back and I said, listen, mate, at least take your rifle, but keep that down by your side. And uh, I said, if you change your mind, slot him and come back. And he went, no, I trust him. He's given me some berries. Um, I'm off. So I said, I'm, I'm here until six o'clock. So basically um, six o'clock came. And, uh, you know, I'm hanging on till five past. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, you know, and he didn't come. So I uh, started walking and um, I'd been walking for about 20 minutes and I looked over my shoulder and there, there's a set of headlights. Uh, but the first set of headlights were followed by a second set. There was voices, muffled voices, but my um, kite set kept bur burning out mm. and I couldn't make out what they were. I grabbed all my gear and started running away in the opposite direction. And then they came back on, on the site. There was rounds exchanged, but they were all civilians. Mm. I moved off from that point. I ended up on some high ground and there was a village in front of me. Um, I couldn't see the river or the Euphrates, but I could make out a line of, of palm trees. So I got down to the palm trees and sure enough, the river went out in front. So I crept down to get water because it, it get now it's like two and a half days since I've had water. And as soon as I stepped in, I went straight up to my waist in like a silt. So I, I threw my belt kit out, my rifle out, and then I had to crawl into a depth on this brushwood, which meant I was soaking all down my front, fill my water bottles up. Then I got back into the wadi system and I got a hollow on the north side of a slope and just took myself in there and I, I just froze. And it wasn't until um, first light came up, um, it hit me that I was by myself. Um, and I don't give a monkeys how hard you are, how tough you are. The hardest thing is lying around for 12 hours, not moving in freezing conditions. Because again, you will you will nod off into sleep for maybe three or four minutes. And then you'll wake up with a judder and you're freezing and shaking violently. So the sleep deprivation had kicked in. My feet were in, in, in a bad state. Uh, the toenails had come off. Um, the, the, all the blisters had turned into open wounds. Um, started walking. Now I walked all that that night and I know I would have done 40 kilometers, uh, but I only made 10 on the, you know as the, mm -hmm. on the map. Right. That next morning, I found myself on a cliff face, um, which was quite nice in, in terms of I climbed down it and I got into a hollow so it meant I was out out of the wind. So I was not warm, but I was a lot more comfortable than being in the open. And I was looking over a, a village that was on the banks of the um, Euphrates. There was a couple of guys fishing, no sign of any military. So spent the day there, moved off again. And um, what I was doing was trying to gauge the distance between 
the Euphrates and where the wadi systems were coming in. Now, the safest option would have been to stay up in the wadis, but that meant I would be cross-graining. So if you put your fingers out, you'd be walking over your fingers mm -hmm. up and down, and that would sap a lot of energy. Also, that night, I saw um, a, a, a road sign, and it said Al-Qayyam, 50 kilometers, and uh, I think it was New Anna, 50 or whatever. So on the map, I could pinpoint exactly where I was. And honestly, I, I, I can remember not well nearly collapsing because I thought I was two days ahead of myself wow. and now I'm two days behind. Uh, so I, I carried on. Um, I got caught out in the open um, at first light. I ended up in a, a culvert on the road. The road was a six lane highway and it was built up. You know, the sides were built up for the flooding during the wet season. In the first light, I was lying there and just heard the dreaded goat goat bells. And as I looked through the culvert, um, I saw an old guy coming up with his goats, a donkey and a dog. But at this point, there was traffic running along. So I lay there or crawled up and the cars were going up above me. He came through and I'm guessing because they had the he had the animals, the dog just wandered up and they went up into the interior. But I knew he'd be coming back at some point. So I got into a stream bed. And it was dried stream bed yeah. and crawled away from the road. But again, I was really concerned that if anybody had seen me, they would they would bring in the army. Um, so I was lying in this hollow. And that day, it was just a matter of just lying still and looking and listening. And you, you know what it's like in the desert. You will hear, you know, pebbles moving or like brushwood moving and... I'm just thinking, you know, are they are they creeping around me or whatever? I knew I had to get more water. So, um, but I didn't realize how switched off I'm becoming. And um, started walking that night. I knew I could, like, if I carried on on a certain bearing, I would hit the uh, Euphrates. I could bounce off that and then head to the the border. And um, as I as I was moving, um, it was weird. Um, I knew I was probably about maybe 200 meters from the river. I could see a, a pumping house and there was a, a faint light coming from that. So as I moved forward, there was an old Iraqi guy in a, in a blanket mm -hmm. and he had a, like a, a paraffin burner. So I pulled back and the next thing that happened was it, it was like a Second World War air, air, air raid siren that went off. So I hit the deck. I thought I'd like maybe tripped something or whatever. And as I got down, I got the night side up and I could see these large towers with interlinking what looked like wires around them. And then um, I could see all the anti-aircraft positions around it. And I was sat in the middle of it. And, I, and it, it was only because I'd, I'd switched off and I was walking and I hadn't been constant, not concentrating, but, you know, probably just my mental state. So I picked my way through this place and I ended up looking at a building and it had a big mural painted on the on the side of Saddam Hussein. Um, there was movement with vehicles coming and going. And then a kid came out of um, out of nowhere, and I moved around the vehicle uh, around the uh, the building. And um, he came on top of my position. Uh, I dropped him, and um, and then discarded him, and then carried on. But then I got jammed between um, a vehicle VCP, a vehicle checkpoint, and an anti-aircraft position. And I knew I couldn't go back into this facility. The only place was to go static. And on this, it was the same highway, but the culvert was the size of a 45-gallon um, drum, but it ran all the way through. So I picked the dirtiest one and I got in there. Now, we've all been, you know, in the jungle or on ops where you haven't washed for, you know, several weeks or a month and you have a certain type of smell. And we all know what roadkill smells like. And I could smell that on me. Um, I had bed sores on, on my legs and back and arms. If I squeezed my fingernails, there was pus like green discharge coming out. My feet, I couldn't take my boots off. Um they were in a bad way. And when I was sucking um, in my lips, my, my gums were bleeding all the time. That that next uh, night, the, it looked like it was going to rain and the visibility wasn't that great. So I could see the VCP point and I pushed towards the, the anti-aircraft position and got through. Now, I've been walking for about 500, about 500 feet. And then all of a sudden, there was just this massive flash 
and I thought I'd been caught in an ambush light. Yeah. So as I hit the, the ground, the boom went on afterwards, and it was the Americans bombing this plant. Now, the plant wasn't a signals plant. It was a chemical plant. And this is where they were trying to make yellow cake. But at this point, it was just a signals camp yeah, to me. Right. I didn't realize. And I didn't know why they were bombing it. Um, so I carried on. But this t- at this point now, I'd say I'm at my, my lowest physically. Um, I, I was hallucinating. Um, I was I was seeing vis- visions of things. I was walking, but I knew I was on a on a heading to hit the the border. And at some point during that night, um, it um, I was walking, and the only way I can describe it was like s- the sense of having electric shock in the back of your head, and somebody has sucker punched me in the back of the head, and it knocked me down onto the onto the desert floor. And it was that severe. I actually turned around to see who had punched me. It, wow. it just felt like somebody punched me and there's nobody there. And then I, I got myself up and I was walking and then it happened again. But this time I came to on the desert floor and I was talking by this time I'm talking to myself and I got up and I was thinking, you know, that's a stupid place to try and sleep and you shouldn't sleep. You know, you're not going to wake up, carried on and um, ended up in a like an area where they'd been burning rubbish. But then I could see the the line of the what I ho- hoped was the Iraqi Syrian border, and I, I sat there and all I wanted to do was get over that border. And obviously our ta- our, our our procedures are you sit and watch it, you know, you spend time just watching it. And sure enough, after about forty minutes, a vehicle came from my left, and I could see the headlights, and it was rolling down the border. And he stopped just off my access, and two um, obviously Iraqi soldiers got out. And the, what the Iraqis were doing is putting mobile OPs all the way from um, Jordan right up to Turkey and just moving guys so they had eyes on different parts of the border at any one time. I got to the the border and it was um, razor wire and it was them big meter, you know, like spools, okay. and, but it was Constantina. There was... Yeah. Three spools on the bottom, two and one on top. Yeah. And if if you haven't if you haven't uh, had any uh, anything to do with razor wire, if you get amongst it, it's going to hang you up and shred you. So I then started moving away to my left because I knew there was an Iraqi town to to my right on, on the Euphrates. And sure enough, the Arab factor kicked in, where whoever had laid this um, barrier, they didn't know what they were doing, and where the spools had come to. They'd fixed them, but they'd actually, if you look down, if you imagine looking down on a plan of an H, each each um, uh, end of an H and then the middle bits was strengthened by pickets. And they had strengthened these pickets with barbed wire to, to hold up the spools of, um, of razor wire. Well, all they'd done is made a bridge for me to like climb over. Wow. So I managed to get my weapon over, my belt kit over, and then climbed up this and then shimmied over, got to the other side. But at that point, um, there wasn't like a tank trap or that them large ditches. And I, I was wondering, you know, is this the is this a false border right. or whatever? So I just carried on walking. And I mean, I was I was in I, my head was that screwed. I, um, I I was seeing visions of my daughter. She was talking to me. I was trying to put my hand out to grab a hold of her. She was dressed in what she was dressed in at the Christmas before I left Hereford. Um, and then she would disappear. I don't know what I walked past, you know, the left or right of me, um, and then I'll come to. And then something happened, and I woke up first light, and I'd broken my nose. I passed out against this wall. And um, as I came to, obviously, my my face was all bloodied and that. um, I could see a, 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 a small building on the horizon, and there was smoke coming from there. Um, at this point, I was probably 24 hours from dying, if not sooner. I've spoken to medical experts, and they said the, the electric shocks in my head were my brain was drying out. Wow. It was, you know, all all the fluids, and it was severe, like dehydration. Well, anyway, I got to this house. There was a young lady. Um, she had like an upturned wok. She was making bread on a fire. There was an old man leaving with some goats, and a young guy came out of the building and. Uh, I just said, um, you know, Syria, Syria, and he didn't really understand. And I said, Iraq, Iraq, and he pointed and he said, Iraq, Iraq, and this is CD, CD here. 
And I was like, thank God for that, you know. And he could see the state I was in. So he, he ran and got a big silver bowl of water, which I, I drank. And he brought me into his into his room. And there was a, like a paraffin uh, boiler uh, burner there. And he gave me a, a, a small glass of hot, sweet tea. Mm. And I'll tell you what, it just hit me like a chemical. And it was just like, bang. And it's the first time I've had a hit, whether it be caffeine or sugar. I was like, boof. And it just hit me. And I was right, okay, I need to see a policeman. I need to get in. I, I, I needed to see my feet to see what state they were in. So I said, can I wash, like did a drawing of washing my feet. And he was like, yes. So I took my boots off, peeled my socks off. And then I could see all the wounds on my feet. And they were in, in bad order. Now, he got an upturned dustbin lid and he poured water on my feet, dabbed them. I got my socks back on boots on, stripped my belt kit down, put it into a bag, stripped my two or three down into a bag. And because we didn't, I didn't have a pistol, you know, mm. I, I could have took that down my trousers because again, I'm in a foreign, foreign country now. I haven't gone through passport control and I'm tooled up. And um, so we started walking into town. As we were coming to the outskirts of the town, a guy went past with a lot of hay. Uh, he was a camel farmer. He spoke broken English. And he stopped and he started talking and he said, um, you know, where are you going? And I said, listen, I'm a pilot. Uh, I've crashed my aircraft. I need to get to the police. And he went, yeah, okay. So he said, I'll give you a lift in. So the three of us are sitting in the vehicle, got to the first town or the, the first house in the town. And he stopped and this Arab came out in a black dish dash. They said something and the young kid started to get out of the vehicle and he looked, he had fear in his face. And he was frightened and I looked at him and he, he walked off. So as we're driving into town, this guy started touching my bag and saying, your weapon, your weapon. I'm like, there's no weapon. There's nothing there. And then he started saying, uh, my cousins um, are Iraqis. Well, you know that a region, the Ambar region, just uh, because there's a border right. there. They don't give a monkeys whether they're Sy Syrian or Iraqis. They're all cousins. So he started saying, um, you go back to Iraq. And I went, no, I'm not going back to Iraq. I need to see a policeman. Pulled into a gas station. Um, there was a, a young lad filling um, uh, diesel um, into a c can. This guy, the driver, shouted over to him. He came up. He didn't look at me. He just looked straight down at the bag and then ran off to the back of the garage. And I knew it was going to kick off. So I grabbed my bag and I'm getting out the truck. This guy's like got a hold of my arm. So I drag him over the old chair. I slammed the old door on his head and he kindly let go of my arm and I grabbed my bag and I'm starting to run down the street. Wow. Well, at, at this point, I'm looking over my shoulder and I can see the young kid with about five or six of his mates coming at me. They're making all this noise and then people from on the other side of the road, they're starting to close in on me. And then I'm thinking I'm running like a, you know, a 16 year old. And I look behind and I probably had a, a 70 year old guy jogging behind me. <laughs> he was like, you know, w running in yeah. slow motion. And again, through sheer luck, as I came around this corner, they were, they were onto me. And there was a guy with an AK-47 and I just said, police, police. And he got me into this, into this compound and he, he kept everybody behind. I was taken into a room and then, Basically, I had, um, like, we had a, that password, Turbo, and they said, right, you know, who are you? And I said, listen, I'm a medic. I was on board a helicopter. The helicopter crashed. We were going in after a downed air crewman, and I've just been wandering around for a bit. I was called into another room where they dressed me up as an Arab, put me a dish dash on and stuff like that. Nobody told me what they were doing. Basically, they marched me out to a truck between two guys. I saw all my kit going onto the back of the pickup truck. And then they put me in between these, the driver and the passenger, but they taped everything up. And I was asking them, you know, what's happening? Do you have any food or anything? Nothing. We drove uh, for some time and um, we ended up in a, like a large valley, an open valley. And as we were going along the highway, um, we there was a, a, two cars that ended up being two S-Class um, Mercedes, the old, old type, and some outriders. And there was a group of them behind the, um, the rear car. And one of them was mucking around with a pistol. And as we pulled up and stopped, they blindfolded me, dragged me out, and then ran me up, and then kicked me down, and then... I, I know it was the guy with the pistol. He came around my side. He pushed my head down and he 
bang the old pistol into my head. And you know what? We all say you want to be a hero and run or fight and stuff like that. I just I looked down and I went, I was so annoyed with myself for handing myself over to these guys. And I thought, this is why they've they've covered me up. They're, they've done everything. They're going to execute me and bury me here. And then the next thing, I'm, I'm waiting for the, the, the shot. And um, next thing is I'm getting lifted up and bundled into the back of one of these Mercedes. All they were doing is having a joke. Anyway, so we went off and uh, started driving. And I said to them, can you take this blindfold off? I can, you know, I can't breathe here because this is the warmest I'd been. So I was aware that there was a guy to my to my left. There was the driver and then the passenger. Everything, again, was taped up in the cars. I could see the lead Mercedes and then the outriders. And then the, the passenger came over. He took my ID discs off me, my knife, my notebook, my watch, other bits and pieces. And then that was another thing. I was thinking, if I'm going to safety here, why are they taking this stuff off mm. me? Anyway... Game cut a long story short, we drove forever and then we ended up on this highway and I could see this massive um, motorway sign and they knew what was on that sign so they allowed me to see it and all it said was Baghdad and then they turned over and went, yep, we're Iraqis, you're going to Baghdad, you're a prisoner. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast presented by Six Hour. If you have not read Chris Ryan's The One That Got Away, Definitely pick this up. This is a story of survival, of resiliency, and the power of the human spirit. I uh, can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, you can find him on Instagram at X E X S A S Chris Ryan. And thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time on Danger Close.